Praise you, Lord. Is there someone here this morning that wants to give a testimony of just how good God is and has been in their lives this, all this past week, this past day? Just praise Him this morning. Is there someone here that can shout hallelujah because of how good God is? Yes, Lord. Praise you, Heavenly Father. Oh, God is so good. He is so good. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who has been praying for our family. As you know, we've been away for uh, a few weeks here. Um, our son uh, got married. And uh, it was a joyous occasion, and we went down there. Amen. It was like you didn't know if you should applaud, you know, clap or not about that. Is it a good thing, bad thing? So once I said that, you know. But it's a good thing, right? And it's great to see your children grow up in the ways of the Lord and see God's promises fulfilled in their lives. It's what we live for as parents, amen? You pray over, you seek, and we pray for whoever it is to be in their lives, and it's so great. Jonathan and Yokarina were married on the 3rd of September, and uh, while they were away on their honeymoon, Kathy and I uh, basically, I want to say did a makeover, it wasn't a major makeover, but you know, we installed carpet. We did all the work ourselves, most of it anyway, but yeah, we just wanted to make the place really nice for them, so uh, we did a lot of work there, so I'm I'm tired now. <laughs> we got back yesterday, uh, drove back from Florida. Kathy's in the nursery right now, so hopefully they get a chance to say hello. Um, but uh, it's so good to be back, and um, I'm I just, just excited, not only what God's been doing in my family, but you know, we're no respecter of persons. What he's done in my family, he's going to do in yours as well. Amen? You have to hold on to that and believe that. Now, while I say that, before we get into our passage this morning, I just have just two announcements uh, real quick. And the first one is that we are in need of nursery workers. Over the summer, several stepped down from that ministry. Some moved on, moved out of state. I tried to get them to commute, but they wouldn't do it. I don't know. <laughs> How many hours? 20 hours? Come on. You know, so yeah, they, you know, God bless them as they moved on. Also, we had others that just stepped down to move into other ministries in the church. All good things, you know, but that still leaves us because so many stepped down over the summer. We have that need in that nursery. And uh, I am believing that someone here is going to continue to step up. We have had a couple people step up, but even now, maybe you're watching online, and we do need people to step up for that ministry. We don't want to run into a problem where we may have to close the nursery from time to time, you know, and I'm believing, and you are with me, that God's going to do something great there. The next one is just to let you know uh, that next week, the Romans will be with us. They're a missionary family, and we're excited to have them with us. Uh, all these things were scheduled even before my son scheduled his wedding, so it was just one of those things that took place. Uh, but we are excited to have the Romans with us. Uh, God's doing a great work there, and I'll, we'll hear from them next week. Turn in your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. If you would, skip down to verse 5. And six, these verses I'm sure you have probably memorized. In Proverbs 3, verse 5 reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your what? Path straight. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord God, and we thank you so much Lord God, for what you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, that you put such a passage in, this, in your word, Lord God, to encourage us. It comes with promises as well. And so we pray, Father, right now, regardless of whatever condition we have come in this morning with, Lord God, whatever's weighing heavy on our heart, Lord, that, Father, we know that you have your best interest in our lives. That, Father, we will place our trust in you. 
And so, Father, as we code this morning, Lord God, we just, just wipe out everything from our minds that may be hindering us from paying attention to your word and soaking in everything that you have for us this morning. Because, Lord God, your word has riches for each and every one of us that we can take hold of, Lord God. Lay claim to, Lord God, because your word will never return void. And so, Father, we ask, Lord God, have your way in our hearts and our minds and in our families. And, Father, for everything that is said and done, may you and you alone receive all praise, glory, and honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and everybody said, as you're seated, look to someone and say, trust in the Lord. A lot of things that we see as we travel our country. A lot of things you may even have in your pocket that say, in God we trust. It's on license plates. I think South Carolina license plate has that, in God we trust. It's on our currency. You'll see it on billboards. Uh, we had, a, if you travel up and down 95, you know, you'll see it on the billboards, on the roads. You'll see many signs about God. And when it looks at that, we have to ask ourselves, do we really trust in God? How far does that trust go? I think it's a fair question because sometimes the way we live our lives, we have to sit there and say, hmm, am I really trusting God in all things? You see, to trust someone is to make yourself vulnerable to them. You know, if you're going to trust someone, that's exactly what you're doing, aren't you? You're making yourself vulnerable to that person. You trust that they're going to do the right thing. You trust that they're going to honor the contract between you and them. You trust certain things that they won't betray you or talk evil about you or gossip about you. There's certain things that you may have, you know, about people. When people come and talk to me as a pastor, they expect a certain amount of trust that what they tell me, I'm not going to blab on Facebook. You know, they trust me that when they talk to me, that stays between me and them. And they don't have to sit there and say, listen, pastor, I just want to say it stays between you and me, right? You know, I'm, I'm glad if they say that, but I, it's not up to me to go around and start blabbing what they say. It's not up to me to go around and talking about other people, their sins or anything else, what they may be caught up in. There's a certain level of trust that we have, and we should have with each and every one. But when you begin to trust someone, you make yourself vulnerable, Think about it. You go to a counselor, you expect the things that you say, that there's a trust between you and a counselor, you and a pastor, you and a friend, you and a spouse, that when you say certain things that they're not going to go and betray that trust because if they do, you can't open up to them. How do you open up to someone that you know they're going to betray when you're seeking help? Which is one of the reasons why I believe God tells us to forgive. Because when you become vulnerable and you open yourself and make yourself vulnerable, you allow yourself to be hurt. It's a dangerous position. And this is the reason why when someone betrays that trust, we don't want to trust them again. Because we were hurt. We gave a part of our lives. Something maybe deep within. Maybe something that... Very few people, maybe no one else knew about our lives, but we did so because we were trying not to be judged, but to be helped or whatever, and they betrayed that. It becomes harder next time to open up, doesn't it? And I believe that's one of the reasons why God says to forgive. Because if you don't forgive, you'll just harbor it, and you'll, how hard will it become to trust someone else again down the road? You may never trust someone again because you'll never give them a second chance. And while man may have broken our trust, you have to understand this, and what makes this verse so very important, God has never betrayed trust. He has never betrayed your trust. He has never betrayed confidence. And this is what this verse is all about. How far are you willing to make yourself vulnerable to God? How far are you willing to trust Him in your life? See, God wants us to trust Him implicitly. Why this verse is here. 
And I have to say this, <laughs> you know, it, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's without hesitancy. Think about that. When you can sit there and say that I trust God with all my heart, I, I don't even question it. That's what this verse is saying. Are you going to make yourself vulnerable in such a way that when God says something, you will trust Him without hesitation and just do it, say it, live it, trust it, trust Him, trust the Word, whatever it is you're going to do. And that's what we have to see. That's why I say, do we really believe in God we trust? Because we're comfortable with those bumper stickers that say, God is my co-pilot. I've seen those bumper stickers, and I have to laugh, because, I mean, God should be our pilot. <laughs> I should be the co-pilot of my life, not the pilot. I mean, not the, you know, think about that. It's God's supposed to be. And I love it. God's my co-pilot. No, that's, that's the problem right there. You have not let your hand off the wheel to give God control of your life, because somewhere along the line, you don't trust Him. You haven't made yourself vulnerable in certain areas. See, when we only, and I have to say this, partially trusting God is not trusting at all. And you can see that one of the greatest examples in tith is in tithes. I can't get around the word that tithing, and God says, test me in this. It's all about you know, the finances, and finances greatly tether us to this world and to the things of this world, to the desires of our heart, which may or may not be in, you know, you know, congruent with God's word. It may be incongruent. It may be going in different directions. And it's very interesting when it comes to tithes. How many people, I get excuses on, no matter what verse I'll bring, they'll explain it away where tithe, I mean, I can't get around, the word means tenth, a tenth. I can go in there, give the first fruits. Well, that's talking about farmers. Okay. And, and I go and I talk to people about so many things and they just hold back, hold back, hold back and they make excuses of why they can't give tithes. See, and then the bottom line is because they only partially trust God. So I'll give a $20. I give $10 or so whatever I have in my pocket. Oh God, you only get a penny this week, you know. I forgot to bring it from the car. I didn't bring my checkbook. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And I'm not harping on tithes, but it's usually one of the greatest lessons of whether or not we trust God. We sit there and say we trust Him, but we don't do what is right when there are tithes and, and offerings. Because we're holding something back. Why would we hold something back? Why wouldn't we give Him what is what he, the minimum of what He asked when He has done everything for us? That's because somewhere along the line, we don't trust that He's actually going to make good on His promise. And that's the problem. Why do people look at other scriptures and sit there and say, hey, listen, it's okay that, you know, that we can be unequally yoked. Missionary dating. And so you have one Christian dating someone who's not a Christian, and, and you know, what do we just do? We just threw the Bible out because we didn't trust God. He's taking too long in answering those, re those prayer requests. I've been searching God. You see, that's called partially trusting, which is no trust at all. But that's how we get ourselves into trouble, isn't it? We only partially trust the Word. See, when we only partially trust God, or not at all, we are doubting His ability to make good on His promises. Bottom line, we doubt His love for us. You can sit there and say he loves you. Well, then why wouldn't he make good on the promises that he made to you? Why wouldn't he fulfill all those needs? When we partially doubt God, we're not believing his word. We're not believing the Bible. Which gets us into trouble. We believe science over the word of God. And so we get ourselves in trouble. You know, we have to be careful, because when we partially believe God, it, we're almost saying that He has an ulterior motive. He's using us. You can use that. that. That's a valid excuse. That's a valid thing where it goes downward when we don't trust Him, because you begin to fill it up. Is He really telling me the truth? 
We don't say that God just lied to us, but you know, I don't know if I could trust that. You're basically saying he's lying. See, we don't like to boil things down, you know, to the very minimum. This is exactly what is going on. We have a hard time with that because it enters into the realm of absolutes. And, well, there can't be absolutes. And the truth is there are absolutes. Does he have our best interest at heart? See, partially trusting God questions whether or not he's got your best interest at heart. And he does. Here's the thing that I always say, and I, and I think it bears repeating now. If we can't trust God in this life, if we can't trust him to believe on his word, if we believe, believe the word is fallible, if we can't trust him in this life, what makes you think you can trust him with eternity? Think about that. Why? You, you, you sit there and say, well, yeah, I trust God with my salvation, but I just don't trust he's going to make good on his promises here. So I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. Well, you know, I don't know if I should believe the Bible. You know, people say other things. There's other Bibles out there. There's other testaments. There's other things out there. There's, you know, maybe they've got an answer. No, you're beginning to play games, and that's what God says. Listen, you have got to get to a point. When we allow the devil to come in, do we or do we not fully trust God? Partially trusting him. He's saying, I believe his words for so far, and then I add my own in. When we begin to partially trust God, we begin to make up the difference. And we begin to sit there and say, you know what? I could do it this way. You know, the Bible is filled with things that we should or should not trust. You know, uh, in, in fact, it, it, it goes through by saying that we can't trust riches. Take a look at Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall. Why? Because you're making yourself vulnerable to the market. You're making yourself vulnerable to the bank. You trust them, but you won't trust God? Think about that. You know, I, I trust that my 401k will be there. And I'll have enough to retire on. That's you, you, what you're saying is, you're making yourself vulnerable, because that's what trust is. You are trusting the market to be stable. Maybe it is, will be, maybe it won't. We saw people lose a lot in, in years past. I, I watched one guy just lose everything. One thing we can't do is trust chariots and horses. Take a look at Isaiah 31.1. It says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. In other words, you're going to someone else to fight your battles rather than going to God. And you go down there because you think they have something that you need. You go down to Egypt, you ask someone else to fight your battles or ask someone else to get something because you rely on the horses, but, uh, Isaiah says, who trust in the multitudes of their chariots. So there's got to be a lot of them. Hey, listen, quantity will help me win this battle. If I have enough soldiers, if I have enough chariots, if I have whatever it is I need, I just need a lot of it, and I can win the battles. And in the great strength of their horsemen. Other people's strength. And, and the problem with all of this is that every one of that is limited. You have a limitation. No matter how strong the greatest soldier is, there was still fatigue on the battlefield. But your God will not. And God says in this, He says, but do not. You go to Egypt for help to fight your battles, but do not Look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. When we begin to look at all of the things, we have to understand this is all limited. Everything can rust, decay. It does not have the strength or the durability that our God has. Three, we cannot trust in other people. I probably didn't have to say that before you knew that there was just some things. You probably been, everyone here has probably been burnt by somebody in their life. It's by someone in your own walk. In Jeremiah 17, 5, it says this. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. We have to be careful. And I'm not saying you should never trust someone. If that's the case, then how would you ever confide in someone? 
What would you ever do? That, that's not where I'm going, but it's a replacement of God. That you would trust others so much more so than trusting your own God. I mean, you think about this. Verbal contracts. How many people, how many times I've heard people, two people, just write it down. Both sign it. They have a verbal contract. Sometimes it's just because they misunderstood. They had a different meaning to it. They'll shake hands on it. And next thing you see, they're in court. Why? Because the verbal contract broke down. It could be a misunderstanding, misinterpretation, or it could be someone just, said, just didn't want to do, pay their end. They think because of the verbal contract and shaking the hand, it didn't won't hold up in court. And so they can beg out of it. We have to be careful about those things. You know, you can't even trust yourself. Very interesting, isn't it? In Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. I didn't write that. Okay, just in case you thought that came from me. That was the word of God. He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Interesting. The Bible says this, the one thing you can trust implicitly is God. Trust in him with all your might. Trust in him. Proverbs, the second part of Proverbs 3, uh, 3, 5, it says, and lean not on your own understanding. You know, all these things that we may trust more than God require us to lean or rely upon our own understanding. We get the facts. Okay, I get all the facts, and I got this. Now I can go ahead and do that. We make educated guesses, and in the end, we could be dead wrong on some of those things. God says, don't trust in your own understanding because you can't see what I can see. You can't see tomorrow, let alone 20 years from now. Trust in me, God says, and don't rely on your own understanding. When Abraham, when there was a famine uh, that was going on, Abraham and his wife escaped the famine and went into Egypt. While in Egypt, because Abraham wasn't sure he began to rely on his own understanding. What does he do? He tells his wife to lie about who she is. That they weren't married. That she's only a sister. It was a half-truth. That way he could be saved. God intervenes miraculously in a dream. He said, listen, if you touch that woman, you're a dead man, basically. <laughs> and he goes back and says, what did you do? Why did you lie to me? Take her and take all this other stuff. God turned that event around as he usually does in our lives. But what? why Abraham did it? Because he did not trust God in that moment. And we can find ourselves in the same way. That should be both, you know, a warning and also a blessing. The warning is that we have to trust God no matter what. The blessing is, is that when we fail him, he can make up the difference when we begin to trust him again. He did so with Abraham. But you see it as well. Sarah, uh, Sarah and Abraham, and it was Sarai and Abram at that time, did not trust God. So what does Sarai do? Take my concubine. God makes a promise that even in your old age, you will have a child. But somewhere along the line, they did not believe that. And so we get Ishmael because of a lack of belief, a lack of allowing God to do it his way. But that was a momentary lack of trust in God. So they did it their way, and you see the complications of that. We've got to be under, we have to be very careful. We can't lean on our own understanding. We have to trust God. And part of the reason is because it doesn't work for many reasons. Our understanding is limited for one thing. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. We have to let God be God, amen? And that means he does not have to explain everything. He says, trust me. Put your faith in me. Trust me. Trust that you may not know everything in this situation. He goes on, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes our understanding is just darkened because of the world in which we live in, and because maybe of our own 
fleshly desires. In Ephesians 4.18, it says this, having their understanding darkened. Well, if our understanding is darkened, how in the world should we put our trust solely on our own understanding? It's been darkened. Yes, we have enlightenment when we come to know Jesus Christ, but still, there's a lot of things that God works out through us. Being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. And let's face it, sometimes our hearts want something. And even when we know we shouldn't go after it, we go after it anyway. And God says, let it go. Trust me. I, I, I know I can't be just talking to myself. <laughs> so as a preacher... I've already talked to this message, I've already sought this message, I already allow God to speak to me. And I have to sit there and say, wow, there are some times I allowed my heart to overrule my trust in Him. There were some times when God said, do something of my heart, really didn't want to do it. This is called that we have to get our hearts under control. We've got to be in control of our emotions. We've got to be in control of it because we trust God, Amen. And even when we want something so much, we have to sit and say, I am not going to steal to get it. I am not going to go and do other things. I know people here may say, I would never steal. But maybe you'll do other things, compromises here and there. Little ones that you think, they'll make a difference. But it makes a difference here. Because when you begin to follow that path, even though it may be something tiny and minute, it becomes easier to, to do something a little more larger. Whatever that might be. And we have to be careful. And usually man's understanding is opposite of God's. Why? We don't rely on our own understanding. In 1 Corinthians 1.27, what, is, what does the Apostle Paul say here? It says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So there's a lot of wise people out there that God used foolish things that they would never even think of to shame the wise. You see, our understanding isn't the same thing. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. And so we have to understand that sometimes our understanding, because sometimes we've been trained in this world so much, we've got to let certain things go. We've got to be retrained by the Bible, allow God to come in there. And the only way that happens, when we fully trust Him. Then we look at the Word and say, you know what, no way does that verse make sense to me, but I'm going to trust God anyway. It doesn't make sense, but I'm going to trust it. I'm not going to change it. See, we never get to that point. Many of us don't get to that point. I don't want to make a blanket. I don't want to paint with a broad brush here. But how many of us read something and we have questions and so we'll believe someone else other than what's in there. And God says, trust me implicitly. Trust me. I know what's good for you. I know what you need. I know what this church needs. I know what your spouse needs. I know what your family needs. I know what the community needs. You follow me. You follow my ways. Just trust me and watch what I will do. But he's asking us to trust him. And he says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And here's the problem when we only partially trust God we usually don't acknowledge him at all. See, because it's only partial. So, you know, we sit there and we talk about what we did, what we brought to the table. Man, that was, uh, you know, that was pretty sharp of me. You know, I, I had a lot of wisdom there. Sometimes we'll give God credit. Sometimes we won't. But it's partial. It's not like, praise God. If it weren't for God, I would not be there. We don't trust in our own understanding, but instead we acknowledge him in all of our ways, not just in some of our ways, in all of your ways. And have you gotten to that point yet? Because if we aren't acknowledging him in all of our ways, either A, we're not living his ways, or B, we just lack that trust. 
We have to give it over to him. In all of our ways, we acknowledge him. To acknowledge here is to show awareness of God's activity. That's what you're doing. When you're acknowledging him in all your ways, you're acknowledging God's activity in your life. That you believe that what he's doing right now in your life, that he's operating. Even if you don't see it, that's trust, isn't it? Even when the world is falling down around you and it does not make sense, you're going to sit there and you're going to trust him. You're not going to veer to the right or to the left because you trust him. And many people, it doesn't make sense in the world, but we're going to continue anyway. I have been there many times where things don't make sense, but I sat there and said, you know what? I have to trust what God ha has for me what God has for my family. I have to do it God's ways. Because when I don't, that's when I got myself into a boatload of trouble. And I guarantee you, I can't, I'm not the only one that stands on this island. If I had a raft right now, I'd pull you all onto my island. <laughs> Truth is, when we haven't, we got ourselves in trouble. But God in his graciousness and his mercy will extend us time and time again. That grace and turn things around in our lives. But are you acknowledging God in all your ways? Again, one of the reasons why we may not acknowledge God in all of our ways because maybe those ways aren't his. Maybe we're ashamed of those ways. Maybe we just don't see him. But there's a lot of things that God made promises, many of which have come true. Others, I still wait, but I hold on to. You have to do the same. Isaiah 33, 13 says this, You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my power. God likes it when we acknowledge him in our lives. Acknowledge him. God loves it. You're not going to hurt God's feelings by saying, wow, I see God's power in my life. I see God working things around right now. Allow him to do that. To acknowledge God in all our ways brings a humility. And with humility is a dependence. See, when you make yourself vulnerable when you trust somebody, and when you make yourself vulnerable in trusting God, you're depending on that person, or in this case God, to follow through. Follow through on promises or whatever it might be. We depend on him. In Psalm 100, verse 3, it says this. Know that the Lord is God. Start off with that. Do you know that the Lord is God? It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. In other words, we know we didn't get anywhere without him in our lives. We're just a sheep of his pasture. It's interesting, when Jesus walked this earth, there were many accusations that were made about Jesus. One of the things I find very interesting is while he hung on the cross, those that would mock him, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they all stood around there and they were mocking him. And do you remember what they said to Jesus while he was on that cross? Interesting. If you take a look at Matthew 27, verse 42 to 43, look at what it says, what they're saying to Jesus. They're mocking him, and they say, he's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. And what does he say after that? He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. He trusts in God. That was an epitaph. They're mocking him by stating the truth. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him. Let God do this. Because they were completely blinded. They lacked understanding. They didn't trust God because they put Jesus on the cross. They had to put him on the cross. Why? They were jealous of the power and the people going over to him. And that jealousy, they said, you know what, we're going to put him on the cross. Now, this was God's plan from the beginning, we know that. But God knew what they were going to do. Their jealousy being envious of the position and power, the popularity that Jesus was getting. It was all too much for them. And so they did it their way. Amazing, isn't it? And Jesus proved them all right. He proved just how much he trusted his father. 
while in the Garden of Gethsemane, before they came after him, he asked if that cup could pass from him. He said, you could do all things, God, my Father. You could do all things, but not my will, your will be done. He trusted his Father in that moment to go to the cross. In that moment when he asked if there was another way, but not my will, yours be done, he said that you have my best interest. And sometimes that's what we have to get to in our lives. It may not, the road may not be easy, but will you trust him? Will you say that your heavenly father loves you so much that he has your best interest? God, Jesus, proved how much he trusted his father every step of the way. And even while he hung on the cross, in Luke 23, 46, he said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You talk about trust. Shouldn't that be our cry every day? Heavenly Father, I commit my life into your hands. I commit my soul into your hands. I commit my plans, if they go away from your plans, correct me. Guide me. He had the conviction. And that's where trust really comes down to, is making yourself vulnerable and then having that conviction that God will pull through. But this verse is not without its promise as well. We're told that if you trust him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding... And in all your ways acknowledge him, he will make your paths straight. Interesting. There's a lot of history in this word that are being used here. We just put it out. It'll make your paths straight. But there's a lot behind that word straight. It's a blessing, I believe, that our country needs. It's a blessing that I think we all need. To rely on. To make your paths straight includes more than just a direct route to the destination and maybe God's calling you. It also includes that the ground will be leveled and the path will be removed of any obstacles. You see, in biblical times, the roads were very rough then. It wasn't until really the Romans got there, and then if you didn't have a Roman road, even then they could be kind of choppy, but they were much better than the ground itself. When a king took a journey, he would send some of his servants ahead of him to make sure that they cleared the path. If there were potholes, they'd fill it in. If there's rocks in the way, they'd remove the rocks. This way, the caravan, the royal caravan, wouldn't have to swerve, wouldn't have to go around, wouldn't have to get off the path itself. Because it's being blocked. Also, cities would do this as well. If they knew that a royal visitor was coming, the city would take it upon themselves to go out to make sure that the royal visitor would have an easy go of it. So they would go ahead of the, before that visit came, make sure the road was made clear so they can have an easy path in. Also, during this time, thieves took advantage of it. They would put... Huge rocks and boulders and fill the paths. Why? Because they wanted to divert the person that is traveling so that it would be easy. Maybe to stop them right there. And when they're stopped, you can rob them. You can kill them. You do whatever. If they veer off the path, it's going to be much rougher. Easy prey. Easy pickings. And God is saying that he's the one. You trust in him. And when the devil lays an obstacle in that path, he will remove it. That when you begin to take that and you begin to trust God, it will be the the quickest route. See, when we begin to trust ourselves, we get off the path, don't we? We begin to veer left and right because we're trusting ourselves. We're doing it our own way. And that actually takes us longer to the destination. If he makes the path straight, that's that's the quickest. The direct route is always the quickest, isn't it? Not veering off. So to make sure you can make it, yes, you may have to travel some rough terrain. There may be some things there that may be some dangers and things like that. Because God wants you to wage spiritual warfare. He says this, I will make it so that 
I will go ahead of you and I will remove the obstacles that maybe the enemy put in your path. That maybe the devil tried to make you veer off and to go a different direction. But because you said, I trust him, you're going to see angels move those obstacles from your life. Move them from your family. Hold, stay true. You're going to trust the Lord with all your might, without hesitancy. You're going to have to say, I know what the word of God says. I'm going to live my life by the word and I'm going to see what God does. I'm going to trust him and assure this destination from this pulpit to the end of that is a straight run here, so will he make your path straight. He will remove those obstacles, but it calls for you to trust him. If you don't trust him, you're going to veer off. You're going to look at the obstacle and say, I can't get through it. He knows you can't get through it. So he's going to move it. Do you think David could have slayed Goliath on his own? No, he knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. And God faithfully removed Goliath. Don't ever think for a moment it was David's skill with a sling and stone that took down Goliath. I guarantee you, it was something much greater than that. I guarantee you, the reason why that stone stunk sunk so far into his head and hit him right where it needed to hit, I guarantee you there was an angel right behind it. If David depended on his skill alone, he may still be fighting the giants. But before he got on that battlefield, a boy of maybe around 15 years old to take on a giant, battle-tested, in no armor, you think he depended on his own skill and ability? There was the obstacle, and he trusted God, and so he w- didn't go around the giant, he went through the giant because God removed the obstacle. And what God can do for David, he will do for you. What God's done for me, I know he will do for you. Trust him, do not veer. Trust him with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Isaiah 50.10 says this. I got two scriptures and I'll close. This one and I got one more. Isaiah 50 verse 10 says this. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Good question. Let him who walks in the dark who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. It's going to be many times the road will be dark and there won't be any light. But you're going to say, I trust in the Lord. He will be my light. He will be my provider. He will direct my path. Interesting. John the Baptist, before Jesus shows up on the scene, was asked a question by those who wanted to know why John the Baptist is doing what he's doing, Eh, what authority is he doing, what's going on here. They begin to ask him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that Moses talked about? Because people were coming out. You know, they they sent people out there to check him out, to gauge who he was. If he said he was going to be Messiah, they had all their tests to run him through. And it's interesting. John denied being the Messiah, denied being the prophet. He says this about himself in John 1.23. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Before Jesus even got on the scene, God sent John the Baptist to make straight paths. What were those straight paths? He was making straight paths to the heart of the people. Before Jesus shows up, John the Baptist was making the paths straight, a direct route to the heart. And the obstacles that were being removed were the sins that people were holding on to. John's baptism was a baptism of a repentance and a removal of sin. 
He was making the way straight and the obstacles so that faith could well up in all the people that heard it. But you have to understand, and if you do this, I encourage you to go through the Bible and just look straight paths. Look at that, straight road, straight whatever. Take a look at it, see how many times it comes up. God will do the same for you. Before you get to the job, before you even have the job, God will prepare the path, removing obstacles so when you're at the job, you can be the witness. That when you're in the school, you can be the witness. No matter where you go, he will straighten the paths, remove the obstacles that will prevent you from sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. That will prevent you from flourishing and prospering the way God wants you to in this world. Do you believe that? Is your trust in him alone? That's where it needs to be. He is your God. Trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And we thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for what you are doing in our lives. The enemy has come to throw obstacles in the path, to try to prevent us from following the paths that you've set each and every one of us on, wanting us to veer off the path, to take a different route. But Father, we say here and now, this day, we will not veer from the path that you put us on. Because it is the direct path. The Heavenly Father, we will trust you in all things. Lord God, we will trust you. We will put our trust in you, Lord God, and you alone. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray right now that you would speak to each and every one of us. Lord God, if we are tempted to go off the path that you put us on, we just say right now, all together we say that, no, we will not veer. We will stay on that path. We will trust in you with all our heart. We will not lean on our own understanding. And in all our ways, Lord God, we are going to acknowledge you. And we know you're going to go ahead. You're going to make those paths straight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for what you are doing even now in our lives. Father, speak to us. Move upon us, Lord God. May we seek you diligently seek you. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you don't even know where to begin on this journey of trusting the Lord. I'm not asking you to partially trust Him. I'm not asking you to try to figure it out. I'm asking right now, will you completely, wholeheartedly trust the Lord with all your heart? Have you known God to be evil in your life? Have you known God to not show up big in your life? Have you done anything? Has he shown himself to be other than what we have talked about? I guarantee you, even if you think that that is true, that is not. There is something else going on. But if you could sit there and say, I trust in the Lord with all my heart. If you could say that today, I'm going to ask if you would just pray this prayer with me, this prayer of salvation, because that's where it begins. It begins by believing and trusting in God's one and only Son, that He has the power to forgive your sins, and that He has grace and mercy to extend to each and every one of us, to put you on a path, to help you, no matter how bad you may have blown your life, what you may have thought you may have blown, he has, a t he has the ability to put you back on the right path again. To see those dreams come true. And so if you were here today and you're saying, yes, pastor, I want to put my trust completely in Jesus this morning. I believe that God sent him. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer right now with me. Would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is the answer to all my needs. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus is Lord. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive my sins and be my Savior, to come into my life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
amen. If you prayed that prayer, whether online or here, would you fill out a Connect card? There's a QR code online. There's a QR code probably on the screen. If not, just go to crossroadsag.net forward slash connect. Fill out that Connect card. Let us know. If you are here today, please, I want to make sure we get literature in your hand. If you need a Bible online, or if you're here, I don't really care. Maybe you need us to mail it to you, whatever it may be. We want to mail you a Bible if you don't have one. Put the Word of God in your hands. Help you on this journey. Give you a good start. But let someone know of your decision today. Whether you recommitted or first time gave yourself over to Him. Let somebody know of that decision. Let a Christian know that they may help you. And for everyone who is here this morning, those who are viewing online, I'm going to leave these altars open. I'm going to ask, are there trust issues? Are there issues or areas that you haven't fully given yourself over to? Are there things that you're just holding back? Are there some things that maybe you're saying, hey, listen, I'm just a little confused about the word. I'm asking you right now to put everything into him, to trust him, and to see if God won't make true, will not show up big. Test him. Ask him, God, show me where this is. I'm going to trust you regardless. Sometimes we need to battle, battle the flesh. These altars are open. You can come for whatever, whatever you want. If you need prayer, I know some people may be having surgery, whatever it may be. We want to pray God's will in your life, so just come right where you're at. As the worship team leads us, let's come.